And hello, thank you for joining me for yet another episode of AWS on Stack Overflow. My name is John Rotenstein, and I'm a developer advocate at AWS, and I like answering Stack Overflow questions. So I thought, why not have a stream where we can answer Stack Overflow questions together? So um, for those of you not too familiar with Stack Overflow, let's have a, a bit of a, a look at what it is. By the way, my details are available via this link and uh, I'll be referring to some of those links throughout the show. First of all, um, where are you folks from? I'd like to uh, hear where you're all from. Join me on the Stack Overflow. I'm currently broadcasting from Sydney, Australia. Uh, a bit of winter, a bit of cold, but uh, things are going quite well with our um, handling of the COVID virus. So I'm allowed out and I'm actually broadcasting from the AWS office. So where are you all from? Um, Let's talk about Stack Overflow. In fact, uh, the best way to talk about Stack Overflow is through a survey that Stack Overflow put out. And they had a uh, recent survey that they put out earlier this year, 65,000 developers answered it. And here's some of the results that they came up with. So the best way to understand who uses Stack Overflow is by asking them who uses Stack Overflow. Uh, what's the typical developer profile? Um, 50 million people stack, visit Stack Overflow each month. So it's one of the top 40 sites on the internet, I think, which is pretty amazing. And they come from all around the world. Um, quite telling here. So you obviously uh, certain countries have large dots. You can see um, major um, from uh, India. So it's great to see a lot of IT folks coming in there. Lots around Europe and the USA. Uh, what is the typical role of somebody who hops in Stack Overflow? So... <laughs> They're developers. Guess what? They're not here to chat about the latest uh, social trends. They're here to, to uh, share their technical knowledge and help each other to answer things about uh, technology. So uh, let's have a look. Uh, developers, mobile, backend, system administrators often go there. There are other websites in the Stack Overflow network, I should point out. If I go to Stack Exchange, um, st Stack Exchange is the sort of the mothership of all Stack Overflow type sites. And there are sites on all different topics. So Stack Overflow is the biggest and most well known uh, of the, the sites. There's also one called Server Fault. Let's quickly pop into that one. Um, it's Q&A for system and network administrators. So that's why on the survey, you would have seen only about 10% are system administrators because the site for them to hang out in is Server Fault, where they can share their knowledge and experience about uh, systems and technologies. And um, also, what have we got in here? Uh, super user is another popular one, a Q&A for computer enthusiasts and power users. So this is more for users of, of technology who have a question to ask. So it's not necessarily people who are working in IT as a profession, rather it's people who are um, just asking general questions about IT. That's, uh, look at some of the questions here how to boot into ubuntu uh, can windows tell me what my what is using my usb drive that's a popular question there um, disabling touchscreen in old windows xp so typically things about how to use the operating system so that one is super user sometimes on stack overflow you will see that people post questions and they get closed because they're off topic so stack overflow is meant to be what does it say here? Uh, Q&A for professional and enthusiast programmers. And often they'll say to somebody, please move that question to server fault or super user or a myriad of different sites that are out here. Um, Ubuntu, this is the Apple one, Ask Different, named after the uh, Apple Think Different campaign. Um, what else do we have here? English usage, so they're not all technical topics. Science fiction and fantasy, graphics designers, travel, that one might be having more online uh, activity than real world activity at the moment. Poker. <laughs> there is a Q&A site about poker. Let's have a look at this one. Does showdown winner have to show his hand? Player one makes a raise. This has nothing to do with AWS. We'll get to that in a moment. Player one is bluffing a mux. Player two mucks his hand. Player one asks to see the winning hand of player two as he's under the impression a winning hand still has to be shown in showdown to qualify for the pot. Does player two have to show his hand? Um, apparently it's contentious. Look at this, there's lots of, wow. Anyway, if you are interested, you can visit 
um, that site yourself to answer for you. I've posted a link in chat. What else does uh, Stack Overflow offer us? Uh, coding is a hobby. Uh, guess what? Three quarters of people code as a hobby. We can't help doing it. It's the best way to do stuff. Um, and how long have they been coding? Years since learning to code. So um, mostly uh, early coders. Maybe that's because experienced coders need to ask less questions. So it's a great resource where uh, more experienced coders can lend support to less experienced coders. So if you're interested in that survey, I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. You can go through and see what people are like when they go on Stack Overflow. So hello to the folks who've joined us. Let me know where you are. Um, have you ever visited Stack Overflow? Uh, what's your pro favorite programming language? That's in here as well. Uh, if we look for most love languages, I think I showed this previously, uh, people would like to learn things like Rust and TypeScript and they want to learn to program various new technologies. Uh, another thing I'll point out is I have created a chat room on Stack Overflow for talking about AWS uh, topics. It's not so much for asking questions, but it's for those people who uh, exist on Stack Overflow, want to chat with each other. I've got uh, some people in here, Dennis Traub from uh, Germany who actually uh, joined AWS a while back. Uh, Marcin, I think, is from Perth. Chris from the UK. So we have a nice chat while we are answering Stack Overflow questions in there. And I noticed that uh, Marcin is asking a question in here. Anyone have an idea of what's wrong with my answer? Down votes without any explanation nor alternative answer and may lead to confusion. Let's have a look at this one. So I should explain a few concepts here. For those of you new to Stack Overflow, it's a question and answer site. So the idea is here is a question. Somebody's asking something about CloudWatch Lambda schedules. And down here we have an answer uh, from Marcin. And a question that can have many answers. So just because somebody's answered it doesn't mean that uh, it's done and finished. Many people can contribute answers there. So let's see. This person wants to trigger the Lambda by using CloudWatch event rule at different time schedules using environment variable. So they want to trigger a Lambda function from CloudWatch events that allows you to specify a cron expression to trigger Lambda functions. For example, schedule one at 9 a.m. trigger Lambda A using an environmental variable. Ah, okay. And at schedule two, trigger Lambda A using a different um, environment variable. Let's explain what's going on there for the moment great thing about answering questions is uh, you learn a lot just by playing with the service and seeing uh, what's on uh, what's out there so we have a thing called CloudWatch event rules where you can create a rule makes sense and you can either trigger the rule from an event pattern so when something happens do something else or you can trigger it on a schedule so here we can see uh, I want to do a could put a cron expression there saying 9 a.m. every day be careful uh, the cron expressions are in UTC uh, not in your local time zone. So you might configure it to run at um, 6 a.m. every day, but it will run at 6 a.m. in UTC. So make sure you do that time conversion. Stands for Co Coordinated Universal Time. Why is it called UTC? Universal Time. Maybe it's a French thing. And the whole idea is that uh, UTC is centered on... Let's make this even bigger. Uh, UTC is centered on the UK... Uh, this is the, zoom in here, this is the zero time slot and you'll see it goes right through London. So London is the center of the world apparently. It's because uh, the Brits came up with this uh, system. So the nice thing is UTC is based on there. And if you look at the complete opposite of UTC, which is UTC plus 12, which is way over here, uh, it sort of squiggles its way around various islands. And um, New Zealand is the first country to hit uh, after the international date line. So the nice thing about, um, the convenient thing about having set UTC in London is the opposite side of the world is where there are no countries out there. So uh, quite handy. So you can then define a schedule and say, I want to trigger a Lambda function. And they mentioned that, let's have a look at the question again. Uh, they want to have an environment variable set to value A and value B. Now I know that when you trigger a CloudWatch thing, you can pass a constant to the function and this allows you to 
say, hey, you're being triggered by schedule one, you're being triggered by schedule two, but it is not an environment variable. Have any of you uh, tried this? Mr. Bob, thanks for joining me. The website is useful for cron expressions. Oh, I like that idea. Let's give that a go. Cron tab guru. Wow, what is this? So this says if I want to do at 9 a.m., Oh, it turns it into English. I love this. At every minute past nine, at every minute past nine. No, I want it to be at nine o'clock. That is brilliant. I love that. Thanks, Mr. Bob. I'm going to uh, add this to my favorite uh, social bookmarking tool. Uh, I'll give it a plug. For social bookmarking, I recommend this site called um, pinboard.india. Uh, Pinboard is quite reasonable. It's a uh, 22 a year. I thought it was $12 a year. Times are tough. Looks like the price has gone up. But it's a social bookmarking site for introverts. <laughs> Interesting. And the neat thing is you can go anywhere you want. And um, I've got a little plug into my browser here and I can um, bookmark any page. And then I can come in here and, and search. So I can say um, maybe I want to look at something to do with Boto3 and it will come up and show me all of my bookmarks that I've made for Boto3. Much better than adding to your browser toolbar. So thanks, Mr. Bob. I've learned something today already. Does this thing adjust for um, UTC? Time, uptime monitoring? No, it looks like this one won't adjust. Let's go random. Oh, five minutes past midnight in August. I love that. It 14.15 on day of month one. So this is great. Sometimes you'll schedule things in cron for every Monday. But sometimes you want it the first of the month. Maybe you've got a batch job that has to run. How would you specify the last day of the month? I wonder if you can. No. What do you do about the last day of the month if it's a variable numbers of days of the month? Anyone had to? Let's see. Cron last day of month. Oh, this is interesting. This is a sister website to Stack Overflow for Linux and Unix. L stands for last. When you use the day of week field, it allows you to specify constructs such as the last Friday, the given month. I want, what about the last day of the month? Last, last day of month, cron. So this is how lots of people Ask for things. Oh, let's let's go for this Stack Overflow answer. Since we're talking about Stack Overflow, um, possibly the easiest way is three separate jobs. Oh no, they're saying you have to specify the day for each month. That's pretty lousy. And then you've got to have a special case for leap years. That's that's not very good. Anyone else come up with something better? Ooh, ooh, you can put expressions inside of your cron things. So it's calling the date function plus one day equals one. Ah, if the day after the date equals the first of the month, then it must be the last day of the month. This is brilliant. I like that. So I'm going to upvote that. And upvoting means this is useful. So if somebody has put the effort into answering a question, then they can uh, upvote an answer. And that person gets a bonus 10 points of reputation. They go, oh, and they'll answer more questions, which is what Stack Overflow is all about. This is wonderful. I have no idea how we got to this. Um, oh, that's right. We're doing this question here. Uh, hey, Jelly. Armin says, the first link you went to said L works for month as well. L works for month as well. Um, last day of month. That was this one here. So, no. Um, L... Cron last day of month L. Last Friday, so look for month. Nope, looks like they're doing a similar calculation within here to try and come up with the last day of the month. Put a link to this one in the chat. You can figure it out for yourselves. I've never seen L in an implementation. Yeah, it might not be. Aren't we learning something today? That's fantastic. Uh, good to see you, Harman. Where are you from? Joining us today, I'm in Sydney, Australia. 
Uh, what are we doing here? Okay, so this person wants to pass a different environment in the US. The US is a big place. Glad that you are all over the USA there, Harman. Um, the, uh, okay, they want to pass a different environmental variable to a lambda function based on the schedule that triggers lambda. So I don't think that's possible. If it is, let me know. Um, but I do know you can pass a constant and that comes through the event record. However, um, yep. Yeah. I'm using CloudFormation to configure. I've done some research on configuring Lambda environmental variable through CloudWatch schedule or setting up a condition. How do I do it? So Marcin from Perth has nicely come in. You can't set environment. Oh, thank you. You can't. You can't set an environment variable through CloudWatch events. However, you can set up a constant. That's what I said to be passed to your function. This should be a good substitute for passing the environment variables. I agree. You haven't provided the template, but in your rule, you would have to set input variables. And here's a screenshot. I agree with that totally. So some people have downvoted him. For, I disagree. I will upvote that to counteract any downvotes. Any of you who think there is a, a good question can come along and upvote. Um, these days, I don't really get too worried about um, being downvoted. Officially, a downvote means the answer is not useful. I think that was the correct answer. So, hey, that's life. Um, I have managed to accumulate a fair amount of reputation of my time and apparently this year I've been the 72nd biggest contributor to Stack Overflow this year uh, with 23,000 rep which is nothing compared to what some of the uh, the top users have but um, the, the reputation comes so I don't get too worried about a downvote but hey uh, that's life so uh, Marson ah there you are watching in, in online so uh, Hopefully we'll get some other votes for you and we'll, we'll upvote it. This is not a show about rigging votes, but uh, it's good to have it in there. Good to see you online, Marcin. Okay, um, let's let's hunt around for some Stack Overflow questions to answer, or I've marked a few earlier today. Um, I, I uh, have a 20 minute train trip into the office and I pulled out my laptop, uh, tethered to my phone and uh, went through Stack Overflow questions. And I've got to tell you, the train ride went so quick. Um, if they have Stack Overflow on aeroplanes, it'd be the, I, I flew one time from Sydney to Singapore. Sydney to Singapore. It's, a, it's an eight hour plane trip. And um, I think it was on an A380 or something. So it was a really nice flight on, on Singapore Airlines. And I brought Portal. You know, the, the game Portal from Steam. Hands up everyone who's um, played Portal. In fact, on Steam at the moment. I think Portal is currently, look at this, save 80% on Portal. Portal is the world's best game, actually only ever beaten by Portal 2. Alex, Alex Games, Portal, very nice game. Eric, now everyone's talking. Um, Portal 2 is better, but you've got to play Portal before you play Portal 2 to really appreciate the story. It's got fantastic storyline and, and, and physics and all that. And it's now down to Australian $2.90. Um, oh, Half-Life and Portal and Team Fortress for five bucks Australian. It's probably like like three or four dollars uh, US. Uh, go buy it now. Um, even if you don't have time to play it now, get Portal and Portal 2. Oh, the package doesn't include Portal 2, but I think Portal 2 is also discounted. Yeah, how do I get Portal 2? Yep, it's also discounted. Go grab them now. Buy extra ones for your friends. There is no cake. That's right, Hack. Um, best best game ever. Um, so my son was uh, going to start playing Portal. And um, uh, I wanted to re I remember how to play. So I played Portal on my laptop from Sydney to Singapore. And the airplane seat had a power socket so I could plug in. No one was sitting next to me. So I managed to turn myself sideways and, and, and play the game. Headphones on and everything. I've got to tell you, we landed the plane eight hours later, and I was like, "No, no, keep going! I want to, I want to keep playing." It's just fantastic. Um, I then took another flight one time and intentionally booked an exit row so I had space, and I brought on a, a, um, a game. I think it was Inside, which is another excellent game. Um, oops, Inside. We'll get back to Stack Overflow in a moment. Uh, Inside is one of these 
go around the environment. Oh no, Inside is the sequel, which is only on that one. Um, the original one was called um, Inside, Inside, prequel to Inside. Limbo. Fantastic game. I also brought a cheat sheet with me. Oops. I brought a cheat sheet with me on the flight so that I could finish it. Look, it's it's currently discounted down to a couple of bucks. Or in the US, it's probably $1 or something. Um, fantastic. Um, Side-scrolling, silhouetted. You will die a hundred times in the game and you'll instantly recover. So the whole game is about um, learning where you're going to die and then redo it so you don't die. Um, fantastic game. Put that in the chat as well. Any other favorite games? Yeah, no, uh, very good. Yep, no, no, that was not me. You knew it was Limbo. Um, you haven't played everything in Portal 2. The best thing at the end of Portal 2 is you can play co-op mode. So you find a friend who has also got Portal and has played Portal 2, um, and you can link up together. And there are missions you do where, like, one of you might pick up a, a cube and then have to pass it off to another player, or one controls some actions that moves the other player. Best thing in the world. Um, so... Um, all aeroplanes should have stack overflow on them and answer questions online. Okay, let's see the latest questions. 30 seconds, a question about JQ. I don't know anything about, um, well, so JQ is a program that allows you to parse JSON. And here it's being used together with the describe instances command. And they're saying JQ extract the images and then they want certain output fields. Um, my recommendation is not actually to use JQ. Instead, they should use the query parameter in the AWS CLI. And uh, Alex, Limbo and Inside are dark games. And unfortunately, I'm a Mac person, and um, Inside has only come out on, on PC, so I'm a bit disappointed. Um, so you should use the query parameter. So what are they asking here? I want to display specific data for all returned AMIs, and editors be made to the post. Look, this is in real time. That didn't even know we're watching. I want to display, I'll put this in chat in case you want to do it. I want to display specific data for all returned AMIs and include tags when they exist. Otherwise, a blank tags is fine. This is hard because an AMI or any object in AWS that has tags can have multiple tags. And trying to output multiple of something, especially if you're expecting columnar output is very difficult because what if there's two tags? What if there's none? So let's see what they're trying to do here. Can't figure out how to optionally include the data contained in the tags array. The command below works for anything that has tags, but I get an error when it hits a result that doesn't have it. So it looks like they're saying, describe images where the owner is self. Uh, images are AMIs, and if you list all AMIs, you get all the AMIs in the world, including ones shared by Amazon and other companies. So you always want to say owner's self just to limit it to yours. Saying, get me a list of images, sample output here. And then they want to get the AMI name, image ID, creation date, etc., And then a tag specifically where it's called from entries. I don't know what they've got from entries here. So they want to get a specific tag and include tags plural. So they want to show all tags. But it can't iterate over an empty list. Um, what if you did this in query? So... Uh, the easy way to find that is you can search for a previous site, Stack Overflow. We've got tags, uh, AWS CLI, which will be describing something. And retrieve the value of a tag from within an instance. So, ah, look, this is something I answered back in 2018. So it looks like now, this one is not specifically, it's extracting all tags or something. It's not extracting a particular tag. Let's look for another answer. Um, this one here looks good. And, oh dear, this is an answer I gave in 2019. I always love it. Oh, actually, I'm searching for my name on the pages, so um, uh, that's why it came up. 
and it looks like the command here is you can do a dash dash query give it the path and then say tags equals so what this is doing is it's saying give me all tags but only show the tags where the key field within the tag is equal to name and then output the value for that tag so it gets uh, quite complex so this is a great way of saying only give me the output of a specific tag rather than giving multiple tags but what will happen if you don't have that specific tag it will probably not satisfy um, what this person is trying to do so I will just put a little suggestion and I'm not going to answer the question I will just give a little side tip uh, you can use the query parameter instead of using um, JQ for example however it will probably have the same problem so a comment a comment on a question is the ability to say uh, welcome by the way to those who have just joined me I'm answering stack overflow questions uh, on AWS topics my name is John Rotenstein so uh, there's a question and officially an answer should be an answer so Stack Overflow is like a wiki where people will go back to it and look up information so questions are the problem answers are the solution um, I did not give an official answer to this I just wanted to make a side point so I added a comment to the question feel free to add comments uh, if you're not sure if it's worthy of a, a question uh, of an actual answer let's pick another question I might be able to answer in here uh, right using spark I don't know that um, can a lambda in a VPC be triggered oh boy uh, can a lambda in a VPC be triggered by an s3 object creation event or API without routing through NAT gateway my head is already spinning if I does my design involves a Neptune cluster in a VPC in a private subnet and a lambda running in the same VPC subnet can this be triggered using API gateway or S3 events without using the NAT, ga NAT gateway the idea is they have two separate lambdas one for bulk loading into Neptune using S3 events the other lambda triggered by an API gateway to query Neptune okay I also have a v S3 VPC endpoint set up for loading data into Neptune so a VPC endpoint allows you to connect to S3 directly from your um, from your VPC uh, grenade is saying I have your stream open the background while doing other things I've got to say you're like programming ASMR oh, my lovely foreign sounding voice for those of you who like programming yeah I can write some AWS CLI commands would that interest to you I'll just keep talking normally hey did you know um, Alexa you can whisper to your Alexa so if in the morning you say Alexa what time is it then Alexa will actually answer back to you in whispering mode it's based on the, the words so if you say Alexa what is the time she will whisper back the response as well so um, you whisper to your Alexa unit if you don't have a, an Alexa go buy one just to whisper to computers and have them whisper back is there any use for a NAT gateway in the design no there isn't can the lambda send responses back to the API gateway without routing 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 through the NAT so they've got a few complex things in here they've got a VPC lambda wanting to talk to Neptune Neptune is our graph database that um, seems to live I've never played with it seems to live within a private subnet and a lambda running in the same VPC can it be triggered with events without using a NAT gateway so the answer is um, the thing that triggers uh, a lambda is totally independent to where the lambda is connected to so the fact the lambda is in their VPC doesn't matter as far as triggering the lambda is so I want to have two separate lambdas one for bulk loading in Neptune I have a view so um, you can add formatting according to markdown standards in here that will make invoked bold
for those of you who are just listening and not watching me, I'm typing stuff at the moment, so it's okay. Your Lambda function will then run in the VPC. Communicate with Neptune. Italics. Hope that's right. Feel free to add your own answers if you wish. I'll put the one in chat. Uh, that one turned out to be a fairly simple one. Uh, before I disappear from this, I always like to check whether um, the tags on the questions are good. So here we can see it's tagged with Neptune, which they spoke about, VPC, API Gateway. It's missing an Amazon Web Services tag. I, I like to tag Amazon Web Services in there, but the problem is you can only put five tags on something. So what is a less worthy tag for this thing? Um, S3 not playing a huge role there and I'll tell you why I tag it with uh, Amazon Web Services and that's if I click on this thing it can show you questions tagged with Amazon Web Services you can also click this link here that says top users and you can see who is participating in answering lots of questions now unfortunately some questions are tagged with Amazon Web Services some are tagged with Amazon something some are tagged with AWS something so unless you write your own query um, which I showed in a previous episode, how you can query Stack Overflow data to get it. Um, then, um, anyway, uh, looking in the last 30 days, things tagged with Stack Overflow. I, I used to be a major contributor here, and I have been royally outranked by Marcin and Chris Williams, who like hanging around the chat room. Uh, so here we saw Marcin earlier today, and um, who's in Perth, and Chris, who is in Brighton in the UK. So um, the three of us seem to be a a round the sun uh, exercise for answering questions. So they've doing, been doing fantastic work in answering in the last 30 days, 286 answers getting score of 309. That's all the upvoting and things. Um, so uh, join, join us in the ranks of answering AWS questions. It's not that scary. You can probably answer some questions that are out there right now. Um, Mr. Bob, I can't find a good recent question to answer, so I had to go on the last page. I found something in 2008 that's really funny now. Okay, you've got me interested now, Mr. Bob. Let's have a look at what this is. Is Amazon Web Services a realistic platform for enterprise development? 2008. So AWS started in 2006 with services like S3 and SQS. Let's see what the answers are. What's your concern with it being unrealistic? Going to go with yes in 2017. <laughs> That's like nine years later. Ten answers to this one. Wow. 2000. This is beautiful. I like this one. I'm going to pass this around the office. Check out their YouTube channel. So um, these days, um, yeah, probably is realistic. And it was closed. So this is also interesting. Uh, questions have certain community guidelines for Stack Overflow. And uh, they can be closed. In this case, it was closed because it's opinion based. We want to have factual stuff. Here's a question. Here's the factual answer. And so if I was to go to a question here, I'm not going to close it. But if I threaten to close it, it then says, why do I want to close it? Uh, there's another question out there. If there's a question that already asks and answers the topic, we can link to it and close it. Uh, this is my uh, biggest one. I normally say it needs details or clarity. If a question is marked with this thing and um, needs details or clarity, then a little close vote count will appear down here. And if no answers come along after, I think it's three weeks or something like that, and it's had a close mark against it and no answer, the question will automatically be removed because they don't want to have a whole lot of questions that don't have answers or, or shouldn't have answers. So if you find a question that does not um, contain enough information and even if you add a comment saying please provide more information I highly recommend you go in there and say needs details of clarity 
helps the system know if a question is not quite good enough and it might might be deleted later on if no one has come along and answered it, which is neat. Needs more focus means you're answering, asking too many questions. Please focus on one topic. Opinion-based, we just saw there is no one right answer. Uh, or there can be a community-specific reason, and that then breaks out into other things. Um, please go and ask the question on super user or server fault that we saw earlier in the show. These are sites for IT professionals or IT enthusiasts. Recommendations for tools and libraries. You'd think Stack Overflow would be a good site to do it, but again, it can be very opinionated as to how to do it. Um, not reproducible um, or belongs to another Stack Exchange network site. And then it comes up with another list. Um, super user. Uh, oh, LaTeX. And my son is doing uh, computer science, and apparently this is pronounced LaTeX, not LaTeX. Thought I'd share my knowledge there. DBA. Uh, often there's a lot of um, SQL questions on Stack Overflow that might go better on a database administrator site. Or Gordon Linoff will just answer it for you. Um, who is Gordon Linoff? Come back to a question in a moment. If we go and see who are the biggest people on Stack Overflow of all time. I know I'm not at the top there, it's just comparing me. Uh, the biggest person of all time is John Skeet, who has over a million reputation points, closely followed by Gordon Linoff, who um, is rocketing up the charts. If we go and say, show me this year uh, what has happened, you'll see that Gordon is actually the number one player. Uh, he seems to answer every SQL question on Stack Overflow within a few seconds of it being asked. I've tried to ping him and ask him how he does it, but he doesn't talk to me. He's probably too busy answering questions. So um, ask an SQL question. Gordon is like the number five top answerer of AWS questions, purely because he answers SQL things that happen to run on AWS. Okay, why am I getting timeout errors when sending emails through ECS? Wouldn't you normally use SES, simply email service? Who knows? Ooh, delete object metadata. What's this one about? It's got an answer. Got an answer from Marcin, of course. When I run head object, I get two lines of output. Is it possible to delete the metadata? There's something wrong with formatting your question. Ah. Um, another thing worth mentioning is if you see something wrong with somebody's question, uh, feel free to fix their question. So um, I can't see an immediate problem wrong here, but you are allowed to go in and edit a question. And oh, this is quite nice. They've marked this with fencing to say this is bash code, so the highlighting works nicely. Uh, and they get two lines of output. Um, yeah, I think it's working okay. I often go in there just to clean up questions or improve the title. Uh, here's an interesting fact for you. The subject of a Stack Overflow question must be unique, globally unique in the whole of AWS. That means nobody else should be asking a question called S3 API delete object metadata. Or if they do, it should be exactly on this topic. So sometimes I see very uh, simple uh, headings. Uh, let's try and look for a very short heading. Uh, most people are being pretty good here today, but sometimes I see something like um, wrong S3 download. And it's like, is that really going to be the only question that ever gets asked about S3 downloads? So uh, do try to make your um, the subject, topic of the question, um, easy to explain and as fairly unique as possible. Uh, where were we here? Um, suggestion for Terraform. I'm not into Terraform. Product images. Uh -huh. How do I create a product that includes an image uploaded to S3 and then displays that image on the product details page in Spring Boot? I actually bookmarked this question earlier because I just want to give an example of a really good question. Uh, if you point to the upvote thing here, it says this question shows research effort. It's useful and clear. And this person Actually, I take it back, it's not a useful question. This is an example of somebody providing too much information. It's like, here is my whole entire project and something's wrong with it. Please tell me what it is, but it's very nicely formatted. So I thank Brendan 72306 for making this question, but um, it's not that easy to understand. There is something on Stack Overflow called a minimum MV, MVEs, MV, here it is, minimum, minimal reproducible example. 
Um, have any of you ever had this problem where somebody asks you, why is my program wrong? And it's like, well, can you tell me which line is wrong or can you reduce it down? So I was working on, my son had an assignment and it was behaving very strange. And I said, well, let's try to reproduce that. Can you make it, um, make a program that just calls that one function? And then we can figure out, is it the whole program causing the problem or is it that one line of code? If it's the one line of code, you can go and ask your lecturer what's going on. So that's a minimum, minimal reproducible example. Minimal, use as little as code as possible that still uh, produce the same problem. Complete, provide all parts someone else needs to reproduce your problem. I love reproducing problems on Stack Overflow. If somebody says they tried something and it didn't work and they've given enough steps, I will go through and try to reproduce exactly what they are doing. Reproducible, test the code you're about to provide to make sure it reproduces the problem. So uh, some great tips here. And um, I often link to this when people, uh, it's a reprex, reproducible example. Uh, I often link to this page when people are asking a question and it's not too clear what they're doing. Okay, let's go to some questions I have bookmarked earlier on the train while uh, coming in today. One of them was that one I want to show you. Do we have an answer here? I think I answered this one on the train. Let's have a look. Connecting multiple producers and multiple consumers using first in first out AWS SQS with message group IDs. If you can understand that sentence, you are now officially AWS qualified. Congratulations, you can get a job in many places. Mr. Bob says, I recently answered a long question, but I think I found the issue, so that's why I submitted an answer. You think you found the issue? You found a bug or I answered a long... Oh, okay. You were nice enough to answer a long question, uh, but you figured it out, so you provided it. Yeah, like, it's good to answer questions, but if they're too long, I'll... In fact, what I should do is go back to that person and say... Uh, where specifically do you have a specific question? I've tested the upload file. I just want to say to this really big long question answer asker, um, what is your specific question? And I have a little shortcut here to say, um, the tips on asking a good question, please see this page, which says what they should do. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Bob. So uh, this is a great question. So this person has an AWS first in, first out SQS queue. So normally an SQS queue is a place where you can, let's look for an uh, SQS queue AWS. Do we have any pretty pictures of SQS queues? Uh, uh, not SNS, SQS, it's a very simple concept where you would use a queue. Something goes into a queue and something comes out of a queue. Eh, think of it like a bank. You line up at the bank, uh, a message goes into the queue, a person lines up at the queue, and when a teller is ready, they will pull the message off the queue and serve that customer. And queues are exactly the same way. But a normal SQS queue is not guaranteed to be first in, first out. So they'll typically, the first question, uh, first message placed on the queue will be the first one you receive, but it's not guaranteed. And especially if a message becomes invisible. So if a message is processed and then it reaches a timeout, it will be put back on the queue. So messages will go out of order. We now have this thing called a first in, first out queue. Let's go to the SQS console, have a look. I'm now calling console for my ASMR viewers. You can have a standard queue and you can have a first in first out queue. A standard queue messages go in any order whereas in a FIFO queue um, they they will come in order. So the first message that goes in the queue will be the first message pulled off. However sometimes you want to process multiple messages in there. Let's give another example. A bus, uh, buses are sending GPS coordinates and they're all putting it into a queue. And you have a consumer who is pulling off those GPS coordinates and updating a map. Actually, Amazon Kinesis might be a better use case for this. But you want to get all of the bus messages in order because you don't want to show the buses going um, from A to B to D and to C. You want to show it going in order. So you always want to make sure that for that particular bus, you always receive the messages in order. And to do that, you have this concept called a group ID, a message group ID, and that could be the bus number. And the bus number says, I'm bus one, here's my coordinates. I'm bus one, here's my coordinates. I'm bus two. 
And the idea with a, a first in first out queue is when you receive a message for bus one, a group ID of one, if any other consumer goes to the queue and asks for another message, they will not get a message for the same group ID. And that guarantees that another message for that same group ID won't be processed out of order. So they've got to finish the ones in flight currently being processed before another one can be grabbed. What this person is doing, however, um, is they have two producers sending messages into the queue and the group ID they are using is, oh, um, what shortcut tool did you use to put that text into on the, put in that text on that question? I don't know what you mean, beer chug. What did I use to put in that text on that question? Let me know what you meant and I'll answer you. Um, so producer A and producer B are sending messages to the queue and they're using a group ID of A and B saying which producer it came from. And then um, they're complaining that, oh, they've given an update. So the main problem is if something is processing an A message and, and another consumer is processing a B message, then if another consumer goes to the queue and asks for a message, it won't be given a message because A is currently in use and B is currently in use. And so I pointed out on an answer on my train drive earlier today that um, that is intentional and um, you want it to work that way. And they've come back with an update here. Why am I using a FIFO queue and group ideas? Let's assume producers A and B represent two users and an SQS and a simple queue is used instead of FIFO, okay? Uh, there's also no group ideas. Consider a scenario where A sends hundreds of messages to the queue and immediately after B sends only one message to the queue. This one message of B has to wait until all the messages of A are processed. Uh, approximately, we don't guarantee an order, but yeah, it go A first. That's not good. We need to load balance between messages of A and B despite the fact that A has hundreds of messages and B has only one. Ah. Now let's try that to add group IDs and since only FIFO queues support them we must replace simple queue with FIFO, correct? Now the above problem is solved. When any A is in flight one of the consumers will receive messages of B even if this message is in the back of the queue. We now want to load balance between A and B. The problem arises when all the groups have messages in flight and we can't get them out. So let's look at that picture again. Um, A's and B's have sent messages into the queue and another consumer wants to pull off a message. You will only ever get um, two of them in flight because you've got A and B. So any good ideas of what we can do here? Uh, oh, he means the copy and paste to the question. Oh, how do I copy the question? I just clicked over to my another window where I've got the chat open and I pasted a link into there. We were selecting something from your browser that added text to the comment box in stack. Oh, what am I using there? Okay, I'm a Mac user, you can't quite see it here, but it's a, a wonderful program called Clip Menu. There are versions of Clip Menu available for most operating systems. This one's no longer maintained, but uh, it should work if you download it. I'll put a link in the chat. And what it allows me to do is it keeps all of my recent, oh, I've got some, doesn't matter, you can't quite see all of my, uh, here is an access key and secret key, you can't see it all. It keeps all of my recent keyboard shortcuts um, in, in um, that I've used there, so I can go back and see any of the ones that I've used there. And I can also have snippets. It allows me to create uh, pre-made snippets of text. So I can come in here for Stack Overflow and if I want to respond to somebody about the, uh, AWS CLI, I have one built in here that says, here's a link to the uh, um, AWS CLI page. So anything I do with that, I can just put in little snippets of code. Uh, clipboard utilities are wonderful things. Terrible for security, fantastic for, um, you know how you copy one thing, you copy a second thing, and then you go, oh, I really wish I could paste that thing that I copied just before. This is what does it for you. And a really neat thing, I'll show you this. If I get some text here, and let's say I open Microsoft Word. Sharing knowledge is a wonderful thing. You can only discover things by sharing. Um, if I paste in, now I just pasted into Word and it copied all of the weird um, uh, formatting in there. So if I undo that, I can come to my utility, you can't quite see it, but I'm holding down the shift key while I do it. And that allows me to paste uh, unformatted. So built into this little clipboard utility, he says as he plugs power into his laptop. Included in this utility is the ability to configure um, 
pasting as plain text. So how many times do you ever copy something and paste it and all that text is terrible and all that and you've got to remove the formatting? I just hold the shift key as I paste it in and it clears it for me. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. So um, you should be able to find, there's another one, I think on Windows called Ditto. It does uh, much the same thing. Ooh. Uh, let's not go to the store, let's go to the... SourceForge. That's the one I like using. Where's a picture? Show me a picture. Uh, forums, donate, wiki, help. I don't know. But anyway, there's one that I've used on Windows called Ditto that does much the same thing. Keeps your um, clipboards. Okay, where were we? Uh, we were answering something about queues. Okay, so what should they do here? Everyone help me out. So his problem is he wants to throw lots of stuff into a queue, but he wants to sort of load balance between two producers, but it doesn't work if he sends all of them via just those two producers. Um, I think what he could do is send a variety of... Effectively wants to say, I want... To, I want B, that sent a message at the end of the queue to still get pulled off very quickly. The one answer is you can have two queues and pull things from two different queues, or it could use multiple message producer IDs. But that wouldn't help with a FIFO queue because B gets sent afterwards and still wouldn't get priority. Um, so if you had, let's say, each producer randomly used two IDs, if you only had three consumers, it would still chew up everything from A. So I don't know if that would necessarily be a good solution. Um, I can spell. Uh, Not happy with that answer, but um, it might it might work. Okay, um, too much thinking there. Let's uh, let's be slightly distracted by something. Um, I should mention that uh, coming up in Australia on Monday and Tuesday. So this is our daytime Monday Tuesday. If you are in the USA, it will be your evening before. So uh, our eleven a.m. on Monday is your 6 p.m. or so on the West Coast. Uh, we've got an online community day that I'm helping produce, and we have Jeff Barr as uh, a guest speaker on there. So I will put a link to this in the chat. And I highly encourage you to come along and um, uh, watch the videos. We, we uh, have uh, presentations. We have pre-recorded videos in case anything goes wrong with this modern age, but live Q&A. And we've got two tracks, uh, one on AIML and the other one on serverless and infrastructure. And the, um, the videos will be uh, available afterwards if you can't join us live. But uh, that is a two-day community day running in Sydney uh, from 11 to 3 on our Monday and Tuesday, your Sunday evening, Monday evening. Uh, feel free to come along and join us. Uh, another thing I want to mention, uh, somebody said, hey, did you know there are some free certification training things online? Put a link to this in the chat. And um, there are some classes for our different uh, training things out here. So if you want to do any, uh, do any of you watch uh, CQ, the ADRS certification quiz show that was on an hour before this show? 
I know Mr. Bob was watching it there. So it looks like we have classes on. You can register. Uh, EST time, is it? Um, various times here. So you can register for some classes. So uh, if you are about to do a certification exam, come along and I presume it's all central time. That's Canada, isn't it? Who knows? Um, do some courses online there today. Hello, Shenglong. Where are you from, Shenglong? Must be quite young. Looks like you've been born in 2020. Um, oh, this is cute. Somebody tweeted this. Um, I don't know where it originally came from, but um, they linked to this map. And this is a map of AWS services. We had something the other week where somebody tried to do a hexagonal type view of all AWS services. And um, this one is attempting to show, let me get this right, AWS API count by service. So which services have the most um, accurate? SAN says accurate, that's fantastic. Um, which services have the biggest, most API calls? So it looks like EC2 has a lot of API calls. It's got, that includes things like VPC, so it probably has lots of calls in there. Uh, zooming out, what have we got here? We've got lots of calls for Chime. <laughs> <laughs> which is the um, the Slack type service where you can do messaging and video calls. You may have seen a recent announcement that uh, Amazon and Slack are working together and they're bringing the video technology from Chime into Slack. So that'll be uh, quite good. Alexa for business. Alexa for business is great. You can walk into a meeting room and just say to Alexa, start my meeting. Alexa looks at your calendar, figures out, ah, you're going to be using the video conferencing system. I'll turn that on. Um, totally revolutionizes the way uh, you're going to do um, uh, meetings. Um, poly Elastic Transcoder Device Farm allows you to test mobile applications. Game Lift, RoboMaker for uh, creating robotic applications. Glue QuickSight. So interesting, which services have the most API calls? I don't know um, the benefit of this, but it's a, a very interesting uh, sort of picture that came out. Okay. Enough distraction, let's find another question. Has someone answered this? Someone has answered this since I saw it yesterday. A Python script as a cron on S3 buckets. I have a Python script which copies files from one S3 bucket to another. This script needs to run every Sunday at some specific time. I was reading some articles and answers, so I tried Lambda plus CloudWatch events. It runs for the minimum 30 minutes. Ah, so their copy takes 30 minutes, but we all know that Lambda functions can only run for 15 minutes. Uh, what can I do? So before I look at the answers that people gave, um, this is a common problem where a Lambda function runs for 15 minutes. If your thing that you are running takes longer than 15 minutes, it isn't a good use case for Lambda. Lambda typically only runs for a few seconds to do that microservice type activity. Uh, can we get this link, sir? Can we get... Which link did you want, uh, Sans, for the training? Let me know which link you wanted, Sans. Yes, it will. Don't know what you're asking. Mr. Bob says, here's a good website to learn about API updates. AWS API changes info. I've never heard of that one. Wow. So I should explain here. Um, if you make an API, don't break your API. <laughs> because people using it will feel sad. If you have something that changes your API, you've got to release a new version of your API and please support, continue supporting your old API. However, if you add functionality to an API, so let's say um, uh, you have an API for EC2 instances and we add a new feature for EC2 that allows you to attach lollipops to your instance and that's a new API call, then you can add that to a, an API without breaking all the existing calls. You do not have to give a new version of your API. But if you're changing functionality, then you'll see new things. So what often happens is even though these um, API updates are all coming out and you can see they've got recent dates, the version of the API itself doesn't necessarily need to change. Um, this, this could occupy me all day. Uh, so you'll often see version numbers. If I look for AWS CloudFormation uh, template, CloudFormation is quite famous because it has a version number at the top of Let's look for one in Stack Overflow. 
me a sample template. Uh, they don't have one in there. Okay, here we have a CloudFormation template, and it says the template version is 2010.09.09. So you might go and say, oh, this is way out of date. I should use a more up-to-date um, version. Um, you don't need to because all the changes that have been introduced have been backwards compatible and you can continue using that particular version. I do sometimes see people put their own date in there and it doesn't work because we're not asking for your date. We're just referring to a version number of the template which is based on a date. Uh, he posted the link to the API picture graph above. Fantastic. Uh, it was that link that said um, uh, format JPEG. Um, that's interesting too. I'm going to bookmark that one. Uh, AWS. I could have endless fun reading all of these API updates. So if you have something that needs to run in Lambda but takes longer than 15 minutes, what can you do? Uh, EC2. EC2 is a great platform for running things and because you pay as you go, you can pay per second. Uh, let's look at all of these pricings. Yes, I have a shortcut to EC2 pricing. Um, if you grab a sort of T3, even a nano, um, half a cent per hour. This is fantastic. I like I know Lambda is low cost, but but this is fantastic value or a micro or small, you know, two cents an hour. So if you've got something that runs for 30 minutes, one cent. What's the problem with that? So let's see what answers. Uh, somebody's suggesting you use uh, AWS Batch. Batch is great for performing lots of operations on files in S3. Uh, here they're recommending you can always use the synchronize. So uh, S3 allows same region replication or cross region replication to copy your bucket, uh, your objects between buckets. Um, but they're saying their business requirement is uh, it won't allow it. Uh, somebody else here, Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Um, you could use multiple lambdas. Another option would be S3 replication. I'm going to add a third answer. You can use EC2. ET, what was our pricing that we had there before? What's my pricing page? Uh, EC2 pricing Linux T, let's go for a T3 micro. T3 micro Linux instance costs that and a T3 Nano it's half that price Now, once you're using an EC2 instance to run a script, you of course want it to turn off. So just get a command at the end. Shuts down a word that shut down so that will shut down the instance. Now this will be a sudo um, shut down now halt um, I one time shut down an instance using this command and said sudo shut down now without the dot h the operating system turned itself off but the instance kept running and it's just like you know when you shut down your home computer and it can turn its own power off that's what this halt command does if you don't say halt it does not send a signal to the ec2 service to say please turn off the power so you keep getting billed. And I thought I'd found a fault with um, AWS and I ran to the support team and said, what do I do? And they said, no, add the um, dash H, which will tell the, the operating system tells the virtual hardware to please turn yourself off. There's a thing called shutdown behavior. Then the instance will self terminate. That sounds quite um, painful, doesn't it? I just watched season three of Westworld. Any of you uh, Westworld viewers out there? I like season three better than the, the previous seasons. Really great graphics and all that. Storyline is pretty good as well. 
Um, use LightSail for $3.50 a month. I don't know if you'd launch LightSail just to run a script, but you could have it running. Yeah. Uh, Vetaf, is the cloud practitioner certificate enough for a position? So um, let me just save this question and talk about that. Happy to answer questions along the way. Uh, about uh, two hours ago, we did an AWS certification quiz show where the topic was um, cloud practitioner. If you want to watch, uh, we'll have it up on YouTube shortly, as soon as I finish this thing. You can watch uh, the AWS certification quiz show. Uh, where we teach you a lot about cloud practitioner. So is it big enough for a position? Um, how does cloud practitioner fit in the world? So if we have all of these painful small screen type things. Um, so cloud practitioner sits at the bottom of the hierarchy of AWS certifications. It's, it's more for non-technical people who Want to prove that they understand a bit about the cloud. So our show just earlier had a um, an account manager, a salesperson who helps customers implement things in the cloud, and they they get to understand a lot about AWS. But when it comes to technical things, they'll pass it on to somebody who's more of a, a solutions architect. But to be able to prove that they are certified to understand the major concepts of the cloud, then a cloud practitioner is recommended. And cloud practitioner focuses on things like. Uh, what's the cloud? What's the basic global infrastructure? What's the architectural principles you use in the cloud? Like, use temporary resources, scale out when you need more, and scale in when you don't need them. The value proposition, not having to buy capital expenses and all that. So you couldn't really get a job based on cloud practitioner, but many roles that are out there, who are working in IT, who are not technical, might want to get the cloud practitioner certification just to prove they do understand generally what the cloud's about. I do have a piece of paper to wave in front of you, but you won't get a job as a as an infrastructure expert if you're doing it. But as a first step, go ahead and do it. If you understand most things we talk about here on the show, you should uh, succeed in doing that as well. Hope that answers a question for you, Vitath. Um, oh, I should point out here as well, there's other interesting instance types. Uh, the A's, the A instance types are, are running on AMD uh, rather than Intel processors, which means they're fully compatible with, with everything you normally do. But is that the A's or am I getting confused? EC2 instance types, let's get the official word here. Um, no, I take it back, sorry. I was thinking these are the Gravitons. So the A instance is not AMD. It's the M5As, which are AMD. So when the A is at the end of the instance type, it's the AMD, which gives you about a 10% saving for the same functionality. Hey, uh, JK Reddy, thanks, uh, thanks for the cheers. Um, an A1 instance is the ARM ecosystem. So if you are using iPads, iOS, have you seen the announcement that Apple is now moving Macs to their own silicon, which is based on ARM type things? Uh, so we have this uh, these chipsets that we call Graviton. and they're AWS created. They don't run the standard Intel um, instruction set, but they're amazingly fast and we make them so they're lower cost. So you can get some real good savings um, compared to other instance types. So there's some, uh, some comparisons out there that say this instance is compared to that one. Just be aware when you launch an A instance type, um, because it's a different instruction set for the CPU, you might have to recompile your software to run. But there's Linux variants out there for um, ARM chipsets as well. Uh, will we ever get R6GDN instances? I, I agree, the names are getting quite crazy. I first of all disliked it when they called things like, the very first instance was called, well, the very first instance type had no name because it was just EC2. And then they discovered, oh, people want more powerful ones and, and all that. So the current, the original instance is called an M1 small. M is the general purpose type, so an M1 small. And then if you got bigger than that, it was called um, medium. And then bigger than that was large. And then double that was extra large and double that. So you'll notice here, every time it goes up, it doubles what's there. So a medium has one CPU and two gigs of memory. A large has twice of that. An extra large has twice that, etc. And what happens is we have a host computer 
that has probably got yeah, in fact it is. Here's a, a metal version. We have a host computer with 16 virtual CPUs due to hyperthreading and 32 gigs of RAM. And then we just slice and dice that to make smaller instances for our customers. And that's why you'll always see things that, that double in size. So you've got the naming things about small, medium, large, extra large, etc., which is slightly confusing. And then you've got the instance types. Uh, T is good for burstable type things. So if you're just running scripts occasionally, very low cost but if you're doing heavy cpu it might not be the ideal instance type you want uh, m's are the the general purpose type workloads um, and the g means it's running our graviton processor uh, m's are the normal intel ones then you've got things like um oh, that's general purpose then you've got compute these ones have very powerful cpu so c for compute it's getting a bit easier uh, the N's are ones that have extra networking things with the elastic fabric adapter. Yeah. Memory optimized R for RAM is a good one to remember. The X's are the extremely big instances that you use for things like SAP. Uh, accelerated computing. Oh, we used to call these GPU, but now they're calling them. That's interesting. Um, P's were the ones that have GPUs in there. So GPUs used to be used for graphics for your games. People discovered it was a great way to do highly optimized compute especially for machine learning. So people now get these instances for machine learning. And inference, so we've got an inf one instance using a special chipset that is very good for machine learning inference after creating the models. F1, um, field programmable gateways, FPGAs. These are FPGA. Sounds like a golfing tournament, doesn't it? Um, field programmable gate array. This is a, a chip. Let me get out of the way here. This is a chip that allows you to program it as if it's hardware. So if you had a particular thing you were always doing, maybe um, image recognition or machine learning or something, you can almost program the gates within the chip as an erasable type thing. And then you have a chip that runs much faster than running standard stuff. So really amazing low level stuff. I used to have a hardware friend who would make chips like this, like burning your own chip. Uh, storage optimized, these have lots of onboard storage, which uh, is very, very fast, instant store. Um, if you don't have to go across a network, it's very fast. Uh, whew, so yeah, there's a lot of instance types out there. Uh, we recently introduced a command, AWS CLI instance types offerings. And this is uh, really interesting. Uh, it could sometimes be hard to figure out which instant types are available in which regions and in which availability zones. So we now have a command here, describe instance type offerings. And it will return, if I have a sample here, it can return um, the instance type that we have running in a particular region. And um, let's see if we can get this going. If I run, this is in the Ohio region, uh, tell me all of the different instance types we have in that region. And so you can see it's come with a real mixture of different instance types here. Uh, let's change that and say, I want to query and only get the instance type. Um, instance type offerings. Let's say give me all instance type offerings dot instance type that should then what have I done wrong here? Not ZSH, I better put that in quotes. So it's now come back with all the instance types. If I now say please do that and output in text, it will give it to me one per line. And if I take that and pass it through word count, how many lines are there? The answer is ah, one line. I know how to fix that. If I put the instance type in a square bracket, it will output one per line. We'll copy that into chat for anyone who wants to replicate what I've done. And what is it telling us? It is telling us that there are 263 different instance types in the Ohio region. So yeah, uh, you can even go down and say which instance types are in which availability zone. For example, uh, he says looking for the instructions here, you can say 
I want a particular location type. Oh, let's do it from scratch. No, don't run that. Uh, AWS EC2. Describe instance type offerings in, let's pick that region again, US East 2, which is Oregon. I now want to say location type, and I can say availability zone. In fact, I'm going to say availability zone ID, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. Um, and I can filter. And I can say I want instance type uh, name equals instance type values equals t3 micro in fact i'm going to change this to use us west so here in us west 2 oregon we have four in my account at least four availability zones that have t3 micro available if I change that command and say T2 micro, it comes back with only three availability zones. So what this means is there's an availability zone in uh, US West 2 that does not have T2s. And if I run my first command, again, you'll notice it is zone 4. So zone 4 must be the newer zone that has been added to that region. We don't bother putting old instance types in there um, so it's, it doesn't have T2s, but it has T3s. But we have back put T3s in the older availability zones. Uh, you'll also notice this wording here. So I said, please give me uh, the availability zone ID, which is this hidden background name. It's saying US West 2 AZ1, as opposed to if I say, just give me the availability zone, which gives me the standard US West 2B name. AWS regions used to randomize all of the availability zones. So my US West 2A might be your US West 2B. And the reason for that is humans have this terrible habit that when they launch an EC2 instance and they don't know where they want to launch something, they'll just choose the first option off the list. So they come in here and say, please launch an instance. I'm going to make it Linux, blah, blah, blah. Where do I want to launch it? And they would come in here and choose the A zone. And the problem with that is we'd have too much in A and not enough in the other ones. So they used to randomize it. So every account had a different A, B, and C. This led to many problems when people have more than one account because they might launch, in this account, they might launch something in A. And in this account, they might launch something in B to be highly available. And later discover they were both launched in the same availability zone behind the scenes. So we no longer do that with the new regions. I think they're trying to avoid it. If you do want to know which um, the, the official moniker of uh, the availability zones it's this uh, secret code in here and if you want to know which ones are in your account i think a good way of doing it is if you go into vpcs and you go to create a subnet yes um nice cheats way of finding your zone so it says my a is sydney zone three my B is Sydney Zone 1, my C is Sydney Zone 2. So you can see how it's been randomized for my particular account. And you can do that in each of the different regions. Let's go to Oregon. Isn't this fantastic stuff that you're learning today? Uh, let's go into Oregon and look at the availability zones here. And, oops. It looks like I'm in uh, IBCD is one, two, three, four for me. So my account, the age of my account or something might be such that I got the availability zones in order there. That's right. Sydney added a third availability zone at one point. Sydney used to only have two availability zones. And that might explain why these are a bit out of order. So the third availability zone has been added to my account as A. Maybe they put that one intentionally first for people to make it um, be used. Anyway, that's something you've learned today. I have no idea what we've been doing. So let's distract ourselves. Have you seen Former 2? There is a tool in AWS called Cloud Former. Change of topic here. I should raise my voice and be all excited. Um, in Cloud Formation, you can create a stack, and the stack deploys resources for you. But how do you create the stack? Um, it's very hard to write. So we had something called Cloudformer. And Cloudformer 
is a little utility that will go and look at what infrastructure you have already created and it will back create a uh, CloudFormation template for you based on the infrastructure you've got. And um, it says here CloudFormate, CloudFormer beta or beta. It's been in beta ever since it's existed. The fact is no one's really maintaining it. Don't bother using it. But I found this thing the other day. And what CloudFormer does, the link is very simple. I will put that in chat for you. Uh, this does exactly the same thing, but does it very prettily. Um, it says um, you can put a plug, not all services work due to cause problems, cross origin resource sharing, so you can install a plugin. Then you go and give it a set of credentials, which I did uh, just uh, before the show, uh, and it recommends that you give it a set of read only credentials so it can go off and read things. Never give third parties your credentials. I'm not sure if this one just runs in the browser or if it actually goes to a, a back end type service, but always be careful about giving credentials to anything. So I've just given it some read only credentials. And you can then say, please go out and scan my account. I don't have a lot of things running in my account, but it's scanning 108 different things out there uh, to try and figure out what's going on. I can then uh, say to it, I would like uh, you to provide output in a different format, cloud formation or CDK. Somebody just mentioned CDK. Anthem mentioned it just before. Uh, Terraform is very popular. Uh, what's your preferred programming language if you're using um, CDK type things? So set up your preferences and then it gives you a dashboard. Dashboard should look very familiar. I can go into EC2 and it shows me, in this case, my instances that I have running in my account. I've got uh, one instance that's running and a couple that are stopped. I can look at auto scaling groups. I can look at, um, what do I have, uh, disk volumes in there, my uh, Amazon EBS volumes. And any of these that I want to appear in my template, I can just tick. So I can say, I want uh, this uh, Linux instance, this T2 micro instance in there. Uh, it lives in a VPC. So let's um, go and do VPC. I don't know where that is. So I'll just go to the main menu. Networking VPC. Oh my gosh. Uh, I will have both my VPCs, please. The VPCs probably have some subnets. Where are subnets? Subnets, subnets up here. I will say, um, yeah, I'll tick whatever subnets I want, etc. And as you tick all of these things, it can build. I just hit this generate button. Don't hit this generate button up here. What's going on? Um, I tick things. Oh, I've got to say add selected. So I add them and it increases the number up here. I'll just go back to uh, EC2 and add that instance that I had before. So I click add selected. So I've selected three things. I ask it to please generate a template for me. And lo and behold, it has created a template. Notice the 2010.0909 version number on here. Uh, thanks, player. I should have looked at you faster. Um, and it has generated it here with my subnets, with my EC2 instance. It's even pulled out the AMI I'm using, the availability zone, the security group. Oh, user data. That's an interesting user data. Uh, the role that I'm using, etc. So it has now written the CloudFormation template for me for my currently running resources. So looks like a great replacement for CloudFormer, which is great. Uh, Arturo is asking, I have a question about the previous answered Stack Overflow question. How can it launch the instance automatically and start the script? Oh, okay. So uh, in this case, they were wanting to run a script on a regular basis and um, have it run. So how does this, how do you launch the instance automatically? So you could create a CloudWatch event. Let's have a look what I can do. CloudWatch, I go to rules, create a rule um, and add a target. So when something happens on a schedule, please add a target. My target could be run a batch job, EC2, the various things. I can reboot an instance, I can stop an instance. It doesn't say launch an instance. So you're quite correct. I cannot launch an EC2 instance. What I can do, however, is run a Lambda function. And the Lambda function could either launch a new EC2 instance or it could start an existing EC2 instance. 
Then the EC2 instance can have a user data script that will run when the instance starts up. Now, if lots of you, oh, the user data is SIP A64 encoded. That's why it looked funny. Thank you for that, Mr. Bob. And what if I went into here and copied that? I love being off in tangents. Pick a random website, paste in my base64, decode. <laughs> this is my user data. How can you govern a country that has 246 varieties of cheese? I used to use it as a demo that user data is not just for passing scripts to an instance, it's a way to pass any information you want down to the EC2 instance. Um, if it starts with a hash bang or a PowerShell script tag, then it's a script. Oh, fantastic. Um, where was I? So you could trigger a Lambda function, but I hear you ask, what if, if you launch a new EC2 instance, you can provide a user data script that will run on startup, but if you, um, I'll put this in chat, if you have an existing EC2 instance, you just want to start, how can you run a script when it starts up? And the answer is here. If you place a script in this particular directory, var lib cloud scripts per boot, then when the EC2 instance starts, it will also run the script that you have placed in that directory, uh, not only when the instance is launched for the first time. So to answer the question, you have a CloudWatch events rule that triggers a Lambda function that either launches a new instance or starts an existing instance. Since you've got it configured, may as well just start and stop an existing one. When the instance is finished doing what it's doing, it can run that sudo sudo, sudo, uh, shutdown command uh, with the dash H, and depending on your shutdown behavior, it will either stop or terminate the instance. So that's a, a blog post that I wrote about this a while back. Did that answer your question, Arturo? Um, so, Cloud uh, Former 2, looks like an excellent tool. Uh, what else have I linked up here? Anyone chatting in the chat room? Uh, no one's chatting in the chat room, feel free to participate oops, in the uh, AWS chat room if you want to say hi to me or the other folks later on. Uh, we also have this link. What is this link I saved earlier? This is somebody's GitHub library. Um, oh, a list command for AWS resources. Let me put this in the chat. Um, for over 200, so let's have a look at this sample video. So it can be very hard to remember how to list uh, things in AWS because sometimes it's a describe command, sometimes it's a list command. It's all confusing. So this person has built a AWS LS command that will list resources for you with a common syntax across many different types of resources and it will output lots of interesting things. So let's see. Give me attribute tags on IAM resources. So it's given users, groups, instance profiles, policies, and it's showing the various attribute tags in there. And you can pass it through a grep. What's another example down here? I thought there was a second example. What's up here? List me AWS instances. It comes back and says, here are your instances in a nice friendly format. Include tags on that listing of AWS instances. And now it's going to show, here are the tags. Looks like the format that Terraform uses. Ah, I've never been a Terraform person. Makes a lot of sense then. So this is a really nice way of, of being able to query resources out there and, and get back the information you want. Not sure if you can output JSON and various things like that, but uh, a nice little tool. So I thought I would show that to you. Any other fun things to show today? Nope. Let's pick another question. Uh, Python script as cron, we've done that. Why did I bookmark this one? Whoa, I'm not even gonna look at that, it's too big. Um, ah, any DynamoDB experts out there? So, let's have a look. Error occurred when using put item operation while updating from CSV should be from, not form, we might edit that later, from CSV to DynamoDB. So this is a common thing. People want to load their data into DynamoDB, maybe from a CSV file, and they want to bring it in. Looks like they've got a Lambda function. So this could trigger 
If somebody just drops a CSV file into S3, it could trigger a Lambda function that then loads it into their bucket, um, t DynamoDB table, which looks great. What are they doing here? They're saying uh, connect to DynamoDB. Um, get, now this is strange. They're specifically saying get this object from this bucket. It'd be much better if the uh, function triggered and extracted the name of the bucket and object from the code. Anyway, they are then reading the contents, splitting on new lines. So they're creating Python objects splitting on new lines. Then they're using a CSV reader, okay, on the list, comma separated with quotes, except he's got the wrong quote character in there. And he's saying blah, blah, blah. And getting an error, a bytes-like object is required, not string, when calling the put item operation. So let's do a bit of cleanup of this thing first. I will capitalize, I will fix this spelling. And they're showing the error here, which I will format. Okay, let's now figure out what is happening within proof formatting. Fantastic. Uploading in title instead of updating. Well, updating from CSV. Didn't I fix the spelling in that thing too? Or I didn't fix the spelling. Uh, uploading. Well, updating from... They're not really uploading to DynamoDB when while let's say while well, updating DynamoDB from CSV file make you happy there I think you left a tile yeah I made wrong you didn't fix the spelling thank you okay so what do you think they're doing wrong here the error is coming in put item and it's saying a bytes like object is required not a string Do we try and reproduce this and see what's going on? Or can any of you see what might be going on here? A bytes-like object is required, not a string. Let's look at the documentation for this thing. This is pair programming, um, where pair means lots of people. Photo 3, S3. No, we want DynamoDB. Let's look up the put item command in here. And we can see that put item, I answered a question on this actually uh, yesterday, I think. Put item takes these funny things. So DynamoDB doesn't actually know if things are strings or numbers and all that. So you have to tell it, hey, here is a number. I'm passing it to you as a string, but please treat it as a number. So you've got all of these funny prefixes where you're going to say string, number, etc. Uh, which is why they've got uh, this sort of syntax in here. Um, I guess we might have to try it for ourselves. Let's do a few things here. Let's create a, uh, a file here. Stack CSV. Now let's copy it to a bucket that I have. Uh, stack CSV. I have a bucket called that should do nicely. So I have a CSV file in S3. We have a lambda function that we want to do. Bool should be bytes, I think. Oh, is that the answer? So where we have bool, that bool here should be true or false outside of quotes in an actual thing. So here, the capital F, Python always needs capital T or capital F. Looks like Boolean is okay. A good try there. Let's create a function, uh, stack DynamoDB, I'm a Python person, uh, let's give it a bit of permissions. Best way to learn things, if you don't know how to use services like um, Lambda and all that, just give it a go. Um, 
the free tier will happily take care of you. And let's paste in the code they gave. And since they hard coded the name of their buck and all that, this is very easy for me. Just rename it, save it, and I can test. When you hit test the first time, it comes up and says, what event do you want to pass into your object? So normally, if you are using uh, S3 to trigger an event, S3 will pass in things like this. Here's the time it happened. Here's the, the name of the bucket. Here's the name of the object, etc. But uh, it looks like they've hard coded the name of the bucket, etc. in there. So uh, I'll just say hard coded, create it, hit the test button. Let's see what error occurs for us. Now, I'm a little worried, first of all, that they did the CSV thing with a quote character as a different character to what they put inside of their CSV file. So that might be a cause. The parameter can be converted to a numeric value, Joe. So I get a different error. And the error is that Joe, which is inside the second field is being stored, trying to be stored as a number. Ooh, I think you wanted to use B. So let's have a look at what they're doing here. Is that big enough for you? So they're getting the name. They're saying name is row one. So they're splitting. Oh boy. They're using a CSV reader to split along here. And let's Let's put some debugging in here. Let's print row. Debugging is wonderful. So looks like their first thing is two, which is their row number here. Oh, row one must have worked. Or oh, row one might have been skipped. So that's good. The next one should be Chen Joe, and it looks like it has broken up into two separate fields, one called high <laughs> single quote Chen and the next one called space Joe. So we have a problem there. Let's start by changing the quote to be the other type of quote and give that a run, which might get rid of some of the quote characters from here. That's looking a lot better. We now have Chen Joe successfully in there, 2500, etc. That's fantastic. We've got a different error. Uh, let's First, let's first the quote character maybe. Yeah, I agree with you, Defoso. Sorry. Um, requested resource not found. Oh, I don't have a DynamoDB table that is called um, what is the DynamoDB table? Emplist. Let's create a DynamoDB table. I love my shortcuts. I think we figured it out. It was as simple as doing uh, exactly what Defozu said, um, change the list. What's the first field called? First field is emp ID. Let's use that as the key. I love it if we figure this out. It's going to be a number. You don't know much about DynamoDB, that's all it is. You just create a table. There's so few configuration settings you can do in DynamoDB, it's hard to get it wrong. That's probably already created by now. Let's test that again. I love this pair programming with all my audience. And resource not found. So was the table created? The table is created. Run again. Requested resource not found. What have I done wrong here? An error occurred. Resource not found exception when calling put item. Must be. List. I've got to put a secondary key onto this. Any DynamoDB expert? I am role. Now I've given it all my permissions out there. Resource not found exception. DynamoDB. An exception name that's very nice an exception message resource not found it would normally say table not found so what is resource not found exception we um we had our uh, community day um let's see if i can find this here uh youtube youtube anz and uh nikki klein one of our uh, technical evangelists was kind enough to appear on um the sh the uh 
event as well. Here she is. Uh, Nikki Stone, Nikki Klein, whichever name she goes under these days. And um, this was pre-recorded in case anything went wrong with uh, the wonders of the internet. And she was doing some live coding. And what was really nice about Nikki is she ran into a problem which turned out to be had an extra carriage return at the beginning of a user data script or something like that. But rather than editing out the problem, she actually tried to work her way through the particular problem that she was having. And viewers who'd forgotten that this was a live, a pre-recorded session started giving Nikki recommendations for how to fix um, the, the errors in her code. So it was, it was quite ironic that people watching a pre-recorded thing saying, try this, try that. But you folks, I am live, I think. Um, so I'm happy to do it. Does the code use a specific region? Ah, let's check their resource create. No, uh, let's specifically put it in there, there just to be sure. Oh, look, region name. You are perfectly correct. I think you are wonderful. Uh, let's go back there. Region name, you are correct. I love this. Uh, have you ever heard of rubber duck debugging? Rubber duck debugging, also known as teddy bear debugging. This is where if you have a problem, you should explain the problem to somebody else. And the somebody else doesn't necessarily have to solve the problem for you, but the act of explaining the problem to someone else often uh, fixes in your mind the problem that's gone wrong. And um, in this case, I've got the whole of Twitch as my, my assistance. Thank you very much. It was looking in the wrong region. Let's save that. Let's give it a test. And index out of range. So it looks like he is incorrectly looping through uh, the system, but that's that's sort of his problem, is her problem. Uh, it's the problem of nons. Um, and oh, if first record equals first record, continue. So they're intentionally skipping the first row for some reason, but I think we fixed it. Um, um, the problem is with your quotation marks. So the code is like this. However, you are telling CSV something, CSV reader. The quotes are double quotes. I just failed to copy. swap those quotes around. I love Python, how you can use any quote character so you don't have to backspace out quotes. You can just uh, put them in there. Are these being recorded? I do upload these shows to YouTube afterwards. I'll give you a link. And so you can, in fact, I should put a link to that thing. They'll, they'll have a nice surprise having their, their thing live answered. Um, playlist of shows. That's uh, a list of uh, previous episodes of AWS on Stack Overflow. Oops, I'll take it back, sorry. Playlist Stack. It's this one. Are these my shows? Don't I look lovely there? Oops. Um, so the person, and let's invite them to uh, watch the answer being solved live on air. I won't put it as part of the answer, but I will add it as a comment. Was answered live on Twitch. Watch episode. What episode are we doing here? This is episode eight. To see your question uh, towards the end. There, they they're going to be famous. I will upload it after the show. Thank you to everyone out there who has helped me debug that particular question. The rest of it is a particular problem. I'm not going to debug the rest of their code. When is this transmitted? It's awesome. You are awesome. Thank you, Arturo. So I'm in Sydney, Australia. I broadcast this mostly um, Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Um, on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Sydney time. 
uh, we have a show called Certification Quiz Show. For those of you who are, who are very confused about time, as am I, um, please get yourself a utility like this. There's one called Clocker, so I can say, hey, uh, 11 o'clock in Australia, around about, eh, around about then, so pick the time in your appropriate thing. If you're in UTC or New York or Seattle or Singapore or Germany, Helsinki, we have a guest on our upcoming AWS um, Community Day, uh, Adrian Hornsby, who is based in Helsinki, and he will actually be presenting to us at 4 a.m. his time because he wanted to do a live presentation. So some people just like to, you know, Mexico. Uh, Mexico has got a lot of time zones, doesn't it? So um, figure it out for yourself. But if you go into Google and you say time in Sydney, um, it will give you the translation um, time in Mexico. For me, it's around about 1 p.m. For you, it is 10 p.m. So the time now minus about two hours is each week when I do this show. Great to have you on board. Uh, oops, I want to get rid of my DynamoDB table because it will be charged a cent or two if I don't get rid of it. That would be terrible. Excellent. Um, I think that might be a good spot to... Uh, um, stop the show. Anyone in chat? No one's going to chat. And I'll say uh, thank you very much for joining me. Um, lots of links that are useful here for you to use. Just started starting my first search. So um, certainly um, the uh, playlist that I put in there, uh, Wolf and Ticks, the, we have the AWS Certification Quiz Show, which is a weekly show we do live on Twitch. All the back episodes are in YouTube, so certainly watch that to get your uh, certifications done. That will uh, help you out fair bit of doing that uh thank you very much hope to see you again and uh, join me as we answer stack overflow you of course are most welcome to answer stack overflow questions yourself even without me and without lots of people watching so uh, thank you very much and i'll see you again next time cheers and then he disappeared through lovely asmr voices ah.